When you take a look at the firearms in the early part of the uh, galleries here at the National Firearms Museum, you might just quickly give this a glance over and walk on. This rather archaic rifle doesn't really stand out amongst all the others in the case. But in fact, it's probably one of the most historically significant guns in the collection. Because this gun, it could be said, changed the entire history of the United States of America in the 19th century, and perhaps the history of the world in the 19th and 20th century. Basically, it's just an air rifle. And in fact, it's a, uh, a rather well-preserved gun. It's on loan to us from Mike Carrick of Oregon. It's called a Giardoni. It was designed by an Italian that had these manufactured for the Austrians in 1790. Not long after our own American Revolution was over, this gun was put into production and used by the Austrians against Napoleon in the wars that were then raging across Europe. How this gun found its way to the United States of America in 1803 is one of the great mysteries of the time. But we do know that this particular type of rifle, an air rifle, was carried by Lewis and Clark during their Corps of Discovery expedition from St. Louis to the Cascades in Oregon, the Pacific Ocean, and all the way back between 1803 and 1806. Now this gun itself is fairly simple to work. There is a detachable buttstock right here. This one's covered in leather. It's made out of cast iron. It holds up to 800 pounds per square inch of compressed air. Realize your automobile tires only have 35 pounds per square inch of air pressure. It takes 1,500 strokes of a bicycle pump style mechanism to get this gun uh, to be fully charged. The tubular magazine down the side here is perhaps the most interesting aspect of the gun. It holds 22 46 caliber round balls. You just slide this open here at the top, drop in the round balls. As you're ready to uh, put a round into battery, you just press this little lever here. One ball fits and drops into the breech chamber, and now it's back into battery. You cock it, pull the trigger, it's ready to go. This gun will fire around 40 times before it starts to lose muzzle velocity in any noticeable degree. I fired an exact reproduction of this gun, and I know that it is very accurate, it's rifled, and one of those 46 caliber round balls will put a hole completely through a one inch pine board at 100 yards. Why do we think that this gun is perhaps one of the most historically significant in all of the world? Well, if you read a great book on the Lewis and Clark expedition called Undaunted Courage by Stephen Ambrose, You'll find out that he asks a question three times during the course of the book that he can't answer himself. He says, how did these guys manage to get from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean and back again without any major loss of life? How is it that any band of Indians didn't just decide to overwhelm them, take all their rifles, their pistols, their cannons, their powder and shot, and then make war on the neighboring Indians with basically an arsenal that could be unsurpassed for perhaps the next 50 years on the plains. How come the Indians didn't just go out and squash these guys like a bug and put an end to it and take everything they had? There were only 36, 38 of them at any one time. They could have been easily overwhelmed. You see, it's well known that Lewis had one air rifle with them on the trip. In fact, he speaks about it in the very first page of the first diary that he wrote during the expedition. The very first day, first entry, he says, we stopped at Bruno's Island today and I demonstrated the air rifle. It was a wonderment to the crowd. Now, if you were to read the 13 volumes and one million words of the journals of the Lewis and Clark expedition, as put together by the University of Nebraska Press and Dr. Gary Melton, you will find that the Lewis and Clark air rifle is mentioned 39 times throughout those 13 volumes. And it's interesting to note that nearly every single time the air rifle is mentioned, it's mentioned being used in the exact same manner every single time. And therein lies the key is to the usefulness of this gun and why I think and I think you will when we're done here, understand this to be the most important historical gun in the entire history of the United States. And the reason why I say that is, 
If you look at these 36, 38 guys that are going across the country and, and one gal, Sacagawea, leading the way, you will find out that every time they come across a new tribe of Indians, which vastly and overwhelmingly outnumbered them, they did the exact same routine for the Indians. They put on their swallowtail coats, they unfurled the flag, they got the drums beating and the fifes fifing and paraded into the Indian camp in their full class A uniforms. They gave the chiefs bolts of cloth, beaded necklaces, large coins, and then each and every single time Lewis demonstrates the air rifle. He shows the Indians that he has a large caliber, highly accurate, very effective repeating gun that doesn't smoke or go bang when it goes off. To the Indians, as he wrote in his own journals, they found it to be of great amazement and great wonderment, something from the gods. This gun, the Indians could never see the end of the gun actually fired. And every time that Lewis tries uh, to move on from one camp to the other, the Indians are always interested in seeing what provisions he brought with them on the keel boat and all the supplies that they had. And Lewis defends his right to the secrecy of the cargo of his vessels almost at the point of, of firearms. It almost comes to blows at one point. But the Indians never know whether there's one Giardoni air rifle or 38 Giardoni air rifles. There were 38 of them. They each fired 22 shots in less than 30 seconds. It's a lot of Indians that are going to be hurting if they tried to overwhelm this small band of intrepid explorers. So when you look at this, you begin to understand the way that this gun was used. It answers Ambrose's question for him. These guys went from east to west and back to east again, discovering and claiming greater than one half the landmass of North America for the United States. And they did it with basically a parlor trick. It was the perception of peace through superior firepower. Because if they had been overwhelmed by any of these Indians, those Indians would have had enough guns, powder, and ball to, to basically put up a strong fight for the next 50 years on the plains. They could have subjugated any of the tribes that they were currently at war with. These guys were able to go out and back, and they did so by letting and intimidating the Indians into thinking they had a vast arsenal of superior weapons. And as a result, the Indians passed them on from one tribe to another till they got all the way to the headwaters of the Cascades at the Potomac River, camped there for the winter, and then came back. A three-year expedition to double the size of the United States of America, to add new stars to the flag. And for the first time in our history, we truly became the United States of America from sea to shining sea, all because of the perception of peace through superior firepower.